Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original, the Science Museum of Minnesota preserves thousands of cultural treasures in its ethnology collections. Robayat performs music indigenous to Persia, Turkey, and Central Asia. And Duluth natives trampled by turtles perform at First Avenue. These artists and more now on Minnesota Original. is a division of anthropology. It's basically things collected by live people from live people. So some of the objects that we have might be over 200 years old, but they were originally collected by a live person from a live person. My name is Tilly Lasky. I'm the curator of ethnology at the Science Museum of Minnesota. Curators in general are responsible for stewardship and um, access of collections. So as a curator of ethnology, I'm responsible for, here at the Science Museum, 25,000 cultural objects from around the world. I think my favorite part of the job is working with people. It's really wonderful to have descendants of the people who made the objects come in and interact and tell us about them. Um, we learn so much from cultural specialists coming in, not necessarily scholars coming in and teaching us about the objects. So there's, I learn something new every day. So this is a collection of about 500 objects that we just recently got. The Science Museum, the collection has been here about 104 years, and the objects have come to us from many different venues. Everything from private collectors to anthropologists who did field work in Ecuador or Peru and came back with hundreds if not thousands of objects that were then added to the collection. When I got a call about the 500 object collection, the man who collected it told me he had a couple barrels full, which immediately I was dismayed because I was like, oh no, they're in terrible condition. But you can see they did a really good job of taking care of the objects over the um, 30 years that they had them. They lived in um, the jungle for 18 years, so they became very close friends with the people who lived there, and they um, did a really great job of collecting, and therefore, you know, the Science Museum of Minnesota now has an amazing collection of Amazonian material culture. These are some of the objects from the Bishop Whipple collection. Within our American Indian collection, which is over 8,000 objects, there are two, about 200 pieces that relate directly to Bishop Henry Whipple. And Whipple was the first Episcopalian bishop here in Minnesota. He came in 1859. And during his um, years here, he collected American Indian objects and was gifted many American Indian objects. And the majority of those pieces are here at the Science Museum and up at the History Center. And so that between the two of us, we have 500 objects in one place, which makes it really an important resource for the people of Minnesota. One of the areas of my study is dialogics. So what happens when people come together? If you think of cultures as circles of influence or spheres of influence, so those places where they overlap is really interesting because when you know people aren't trying to take over a culture or eliminate a culture, those really wonderful places in between create amazing artworks. This is kind of a quintessential dialogic object. It's an altar cloth that would have been used in the Episcopal Church. And the beadwork says Wakan, and Wakan is the Dakota word for the Great Spirit. So it's this wonderful blending of cultures coming together. Mm -hmm. 
these are some of the museum's ethnobotanical specimens and this is a collection of corn beans and squash, sunflowers, tobacco that are, have all been indigenously cultivated, so cultivated by American Indian people in North America. And um, there are specimens from um, all sorts of tribes. We do have quite a lot from the Mandan in North Dakota. And what you're seeing here are, are the original corn cobs that sat here for years until um, a local man came and said, how about you give me some of those um, kernels and I'll try and germinate them. And you can see where we took out certain kernels right there. And amazingly enough, they did germinate, you know, after being 50, 60, up to 100 years old. We have an American Indian ethnobotanist, his name is Scott Shoemaker, and we work with the American Indian OIC school in Minneapolis, so we hire their students to come work on our gardens. And um, it's, it's just kind of had a life of its own, and it's very integrated into the American Indian community here in the Twin Cities. What makes a collection important are the people who are connected to it. And so we really encourage folks to come in and interact with the collections and then we learn more about them. What we have in the storage area, in addition to anthropology and objects, are biology and paleontology. You know, in total, it's approximately 1.75 million objects. They really are just a treasure for the people of Minnesota and the world. Well, my very first character was Harriet, and Harriet is taken after my dog at that time. She was a golden retriever, and I would sketch her a lot because she slept under my drawing table. And then I one day sketched her in a ballet costume, and that led to my first book, Harriet's Recital.
Bandar means the port, and the whole song is actually based on this guy who is a fisherman singing about the fact that he's promised his wife that he's never going to go back to go fish for days and months away. And a part of the lyric that everybody always loves is that he actually says, God, if I ever come back to the port again, you have the right to break my knees. It's all about yearning for that kind of love. The essence of Persian music comes from its poetry. There isn't a way to separate the lyrics from the melody, from the rhythm, from, from the meaning of what I'm singing about. And most of them are all about love. It's very much like uh, gospel music or the music of the villagers. The rhythm of the work that they did in, on the land defined what they said, the lyrics, and then it defines the music. Zulfe Yaram is actually part of a classical piece. Zulfe Yaram means the hair of my lover. And the whole piece is about the beauty, the, the being in love and what it felt like to look at her hair. Her hair moving in the wind as she was on the horse and moving and how sweet it was and how the smell of it was moving. You have similarities between uh, the Arabic and the Turkish instruments. It can be found everywhere, but the Persian music is very specifically just Iran, which is very, it's very different than the other musics on either side. You know, it's very unique, the musical style and the technique and the instruments. Even the exact same melody may reside within a Turkish group and they play it differently. <laughs> Music has a way of doing that for people that connects them at the heart where they can put the politics and they can put the religion and they can put everything aside and just be. And I think being able to offer that to a community is really special. You just kind of just lay it out there on the piece of paper and if it looks good, great. If it fails, then it's over and done with. There's no going back and correcting it. Ideally, when you ink a comic book, it should have that same sense of immediacy to it. I recently got back from a two-year stint studying Japanese calligraphy as a part of a research scholarship funded by the Japanese government. I think one of the things that really makes uh, East Asian calligraphy unique is how it strikes a balance between this kind of sense of liveliness, this sort of vitality and a stability. Um, you can look at the characters and they feel very stable, but at the same time there's this incredible sense of movement to it. You know, each of the individual lines is this kind of dynamic stroke. But at the same time, of course, you want the sense of life and movement and energy to it. And so for me, kind of looking at at some of these fundamentals that I learned from East Asian calligraphy, it, it was a, a very easy for me to apply those to my comics. My work has become not only more consistent, but also has more of kind of a sense of energy to it. I've been drawing comics since I was 16, and actually Japanese comics played a really significant role right from the get-go. I've actually spent uh, about half of the last decade living in Japan. Um, first as an English teacher in southern Japan, and secondly as a calligraphy research scholar. Tonoharu is a uh, planned four-volume graphic novel I'm working on about a young American college graduate who moves to Japan and kind of lives in rural Japan and teaches at a junior high school. Uh, it's a work of fiction, but it was heavily kind of influenced by my own experience kind of doing a similar sort of thing. For writing Tonoharu, I, I kind of start with something that's maybe somewhat similar to a screenplay where you just sort of show the dialogue that the characters are saying. And eventually I move into something like this where it's just, you know, chicken scratchings. I mean, it's just to get some sort of visual sense of, of what I'm looking at uh, for the stories themselves. And as I say, very kind of loose, sort of crude drawings. 
Generally speaking, I have, you know, four panels per page, and I draw each panel kind of on its own sheet of paper, like this. I scan that into a computer, shrink it down, add the words, add the color. With Tonohara, I'm trying to sort of give a sense of what it's like to live abroad for an extended period of time. And that's obviously a very kind of complicated uh, scenario that has many different aspects to it as you kind of get used to the culture. I draw my uh, comics in three main steps. Uh, the first is penciling, and then inking with a brush, and then finally inking with a dip pen. Right now I'm penciling the panel, and that's basically, you know, as you might expect. Going over with a pencil, sort of trying to define the space, get a sense of, of what I want to include and what I want to exclude in, in terms of the composition of the shot. For this particular scene, uh, the main character has returned home from a, uh, a trip to, to Kyoto. This is the part where I ink with a brush. Uh, that's taking all those pencil lines where they're kind of, kind of have this sort of fuzzy energy to them and trying to sort of distill those down to a single kind of dynamic stroke for each one. The character is what matters most, so I tried to have just as few strokes as possible for the characters themselves so that they would sort of pop out more. Just trying to establish the city of Kyoto in this, in this uh, series of scenes, and so this is one that tries to communicate busy marketplace. For the smaller lines, I use what's called a dip pen, which you just dip in ink like that. And it's, it's great because it, it gives you these kind of uh, fine control over the lines. You can do kind of these parallel lines that it would be very difficult to do with the brush. But at the same time, an advantage that it has is uh, you can go from thick to thin. So you can get lines that are maybe a little more interesting. Foreign travels had a really profound effect both on my work and kind of, I'd say, my life in general. I've tried in Tonoharu to kind of express that experience, to show what it's like to go to a country where, you know, you may not know the language, you don't know the customs, and, and what does that mean, you know, how does that affect your perception of the world and your understanding. I decided to go with a very limited color palette. As an independent cartoonist, you can't really afford to do full color throughout. But also I think I was very heavily influenced by Hokusai, which is a Japanese uh, artist who lived in the 19th century. He did that kind of very famous, the great wave of Kanagawa woodblock print. I think Lars plays a really important role in independent comics, you know, not just here in Minnesota, but also, you know, across the country. He's um, really doing a good job marketing his book. Um, that's one thing that sets him apart from a lot of self-publishers. So I have another two volumes of Tono Haru that I'd like to finish up. And after that, I'd really like to write kind of a uh, layperson friendly introduction to East Asian calligraphy as a comic book, because I think it's a really interesting art form that really deserves kind of this kind of user-friendly sort of introduction that doesn't really exist in the English language at present.
death of losing to be alone I try My name is uh, Eric Berry. I play mandolin with Trampled by Turtles. We are all standing. Uh, we all sat until a show in June of 2010, and we all stood, and we've stood ever since. We played this uh, little bar in uh, uh, Crested Butte, Colorado, where if you weren't one of the eight people up front, you didn't see the show. Because it was just this little stage, and we were just all cramped in there, and people standing over us. And we, got, we played to a sold out crowd and we got done and you know, we're out in the crowd having a drink and like, I personally was asked a couple of times what I thought about the fact the band didn't stand up by people who didn't know I was in the band. And we all had that happen and it was kind of like, okay, that's a little weird, you know, like they have no idea who we are. And what we discovered is that it's a lot more physically comfortable to play some of the really fast songs standing up. Because I would play with like my feet off the ground, like sitting down, I'd be doing stuff like this. And I'm like, how can I stand up and do that? And it's like, well, I can't. And so I'm a lot more physically relaxed. <laughs> There's been some discussion about whether we're going to stay standing or not. And a few of us have said they're never sitting again. <laughs> I've walked off stage saying like, well, as a mandolin player, I didn't have a very good show, but I think as a band, we had a really good show. And it's sort of a complicated set of criteria where I'm sort of uh, judging how I personally felt I executed what I was trying to do, and then I'm comparing it with how it seems like the whole vibe of the show is going and how people are receiving it. You know, if, if Dave Simnett's having a great night singing up like all those words and his delivery, and it's like happening there, and I'm not feeling like I'm keeping up, it can be like kind of personally frustrating, but sort of exciting to be like, all right, things are going good. You know, we, we play a lot of shows, and I've played these songs a lot, so there's a part of me that can kind of do it on autopilot, and that's not good. But then if you're thinking about every little thing that's happening, you're like overthinking it almost. So there's a sort of like middle ground where you have to be detached enough that it's relaxed, but into it enough that you're focused. And um, when you hit that, and when, every, when all five of us hit that, it's awesome.
Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.